Hello and welcome to Unleashed. I'm your host, Will Bachman. If you visit umbrex.com slash unleashed, you can find the transcript for this episode and all 529 episodes that we have published so far. I am so pleased to welcome today Weijin Kong, who entered McKinsey with me as a business analyst back in 2001. We've known each other for over two decades. Weijin is the co-author, along with Sun Yun Si, of Positive Influence, the first and last mile of leadership. And Weijin uh, works at a consulting firm, Lynn Hart, which is a leadership firm based in, uh, well, uh, in Asia, but they're global. Uh, Weijin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Will. It's amazing to have this opportunity for us to reconnect uh, and uh, also for me to have a chance to uh, uh, connect with all the amazing professionals and leaders in the Umbrix network. So I am so excited to dig into this book about influence that you've written. Um, I want to maybe just jump right into chapter seven, where you talk about the basics of influence. Now, when you and I were, I think, associates at the firm and went through the initial leadership workshop, we got issued this little handbook, Interpersonal and Interactive Skills, which I have in my hands today. I've continued to refer to this book that we got when we were back at McKinsey. And I found it so powerful, the training that we got on influence. And they took an approach that was more about influence tactics, right? So which really expanded my world, like explaining, asking, stating, inspiring, and exchanging, alliance building. Um, so like specific different forms. You take a slightly different like way of cutting it or thinking about it. Um, talk to me, you have in the basics of influence, chapter seven, you have eight points. Maybe you could walk us through those points, the basics of influence and how you think about you know, presenting different influencing techniques which is you know, a slightly different cut at it than, than we had at McKinsey. Absolutely. Wow, Will, I'm, I'm so impressed that you still kept that template, uh, that, that uh, pamphlet, uh, which uh, I, I confess I uh, had not even remembered uh, that we had, but I, I think we got amazing training on and professional development and mentoring from our McKinsey days. And it's certainly one of the inspirations for me uh, to uh, give back uh, to others by creating uh, the book as well as all of our leadership programs that inform the book. Um, maybe I could, uh, you know, bridge to our McKinsey experience by uh, making a statement uh, which hopefully does justice to the firm, but also is still points out uh, some of the less touched territories, you know, in the traditional consulting work of which McKinsey epitomizes, and we did, the overwhelming focus is really on the content, right? The insights, the process. Um, and uh, we spent a lot of time uh, creating PowerPoints and, uh, you know, defining what is the task. Uh, whereas um, in, in influencing more senior clients, senior leaders, and to really get the impact from out of the content in terms of implementation, in terms of people's confidence uh, in what is needs to be done. That's really in the relationship uh, realm. And that's uh, one of the big premises of uh, positive influence in our book is that uh, how do you be really intentional about having both task outcomes as well as relational outcomes. And relationship we define as how do people think, of, feel about the task, not just think, feel about the task. How do they feel about themselves in relation to the task? Are they motivated? Are they ambivalent? Are they passionate? Are they inspired? Um, and also how do they relate to others who need to be really motivated and inspired about uh, the task? And uh, traditional consulting can be so much more powerful, we believe, if the professionals uh, spend uh, just a little bit more of mind share and of their own heart, right, influencing how people feel about the work 
that needs to be done and not just stop at defining and laying out uh, tremendously detail what, uh, why it needs to be done, what needs to be done, how it needs to be done, which uh, I think people do a supreme uh, job of. I think the second uh, most basic thing that uh, you're right, uh, we, we start to bring out uh, in chapter seven and eight, but then we take uh, really expand on in chapter nine, 10 and onwards is really uh, people are influenced far more about how we ourselves feel about something and the heart and the purpose that we have for what we're trying to influence to others. And that comes from our being. And that is uh, really deep uh, into, uh, into the whole heart and soul territory. And um, yet, so if we just focus our influencing uh, efforts on what we think and our words, that uh, is only touching about a third of what in actually affects and influences uh, people. Uh, so the book uh, lays out, uh, you know, how you can be very intentional about mobilizing your own being to better connect with your own personal qualities of courage, care, and compassion, and channel that to the task uh, that in fact the client uh, or even yourself as a consultant uh, need to do and influence better on. So let me pause here and see where you like to uh, uh, steer us to dive deeper in. All right. Well, let's talk about that two thirds of influencing that is not the words that you say. Uh, help expand on that idea of you know bringing your whole being to the influencing task. Absolutely. So maybe I'll just touch on three, you know, as a, as a McKinsey person, we, we always think of everything in threes. So first really is the personal qualities. Uh, so as human beings, we all have set of personal qualities that are really universal, but each one of us may uh, have different level of access to these qualities. So I talked about three, courage. So the courage is what helps us do what is difficult, what we fear. A second is care. Like, do we care about the people um, and not just the task and the business outcome, right? Have the people's experience of, uh, of doing something difficult uh, for the business that they didn't do before, which is typically what the consultants uh, get involved in. And, uh, and compassion, I think, is really important because in these disruptive disequilibrium times, a lot of people are going through a tough time, be it in the business or be it in the, their personal lives. And uh, so showing compassion for uh, where people are struggling, maybe they, they're resisting a change, right? And, and showing compassion for why they're doing that um, can oftentimes uh, build the basis for them being more open to what uh, they're resisting. Uh, so, um, and there are also other qualities such as humility and curiosity, which we found to be very central in creating more of a powerful common ground, a neutral ground for people to talk about and air and, and discuss difficult issues. Two other aspects of the, the two thirds that uh, is so powerful in how we impact and influence people is the second one is emotion. Um, you rem might remember me from my uh, BA days as probably a very emotionless uh, creature. And uh, so different people have different access to their emotions. Uh, but in the more higher stake situations, um, emotions typically are high, whether people show it or not. And they have very important informational content. Uh, because sometimes if you don't address the underlying emotions, the hidden tensions, uh, you know, what's really uh, blocking people, it's very hard to get to people to actually talk about the task at the really the task level. So how do you keep developing your own emotional intelligence and encourage others to express their emotions in more constructive ways, um, we find is a very uh, big hidden lever of influencing more effectively. Last one is state. Now state it is related to emotion, but a bit different. You know, st a state is, are you composed? Are you anxious? You know, are you very mobilized? So it's really in the moment, um, how your whole being is uh, present um, and all the different aspects of your being is present. And we find that it's very important to align your state to your influence uh, attempt. 
For example, if you really want people to uh, pay attention to the really difficult issues, uh, probably having a light atmosphere and a very light uh, joking state uh, uh, or even casual state uh, would be very inappropriate. So this and other aspects of uh, uh, the two thirds we find are really, uh, you know, where somebody can go from being a good influencer to a great influencer. Let's talk a bit about some, just some of the basics. So you have a list of, you know, eight items uh, in chapter seven, starts with be deliberate, talk through some of the you know, those eight items on the list that chapter seven is all about, about just, just these basic, basic tools. Uh, so I think starting with being uh, deliberate, uh, you know, we, any one of us uh, will probably have 10, 20, even 30 influence attempts in any given day, just in work and I'm not even counting, you know, the probably a, a, a similar number in a personal uh, in the personal realm, right? Being deliberate means uh, at least picking for some of the higher stakes situations, uh, whereby you actually consciously ask yourself, what is the co positive influence outcomes that uh, I should really set, uh, given the context and the pressures that um, that uh, you know the situation uh, faces uh, that impinges on the others. And then think about, okay, relative to those positive outcomes, uh, where are people uh, coming from? You know, the people that who need to be influenced, who need to move in that certain direction, right? What's their starting um, attitude, their starting emotion and what they're inclined to do or not do and why, right? Is it because of how they feel logically about the, the, the matter or is it actually they, they're stuck emotionally because of something that uh, they've experienced in the past or now, uh, for example, interpersonal dynamics. So with that knowledge of, okay, here's how I want to move people, um, then the knowledge of here's where X, Y, Z, each individually, you have to think about each person individually, where they are, their starting point. Then you can devise what we call the influence pathway, which is how do I want each person to think, feel, and do differently than their natural current uh, inclination, right? So by having this intentionality of how do you want the other person to think, feel, and do, um, then you can go into that interaction being guided by that intentionality, right? So obviously this is not like military planning, actually even in the military, the planning, you, you know, the plan probably just survives the first uh, cannon shot. Uh, but the idea is that the intentionality forces you to think about what outcomes you're trying to get, where the person's starting point is, and how, what does the person need to experience logically, emotionally, in, and in action tendency in order to move towards uh, the positive um, outcome? So the last part of being deliberate is really after the influence attempt, or frankly, even better, during the influence attempt, you know, being really conscious of how um, your influence attempt is actually going. You know, is the person kind of responding to what you what you're doing in the way that you intended, or in fact, the person has just gone completely in a different direction, or or new information and new problems or new opportunities have um, have emerged. Uh, the more real time you can be conscious about the impact that you are having on the person or how the person is showing up, regardless of your influence the more quickly then you can adjust your influence strategy. And sometimes you find that you need to adjust the outcomes you've set. Maybe the outcomes you set before were too ambitious and you can only reach that through several discussions. Or maybe you weren't ambitious enough and the person is challenging you actually to be more, to be more ambitious. Uh, but understanding the impact that you're having, understanding how the other person is actually showing up and updating your own um, understanding of, uh, therefore, the right outcomes that you should collectively aim for and how to move towards that is really the, the, the last mile of the being uh, deliberate. And then that allows you to, uh, to, to adjust 
uh, your strategy and better align your being and your state and your own emotions uh, to that. Walk us through a case example of a leader that you have worked with um, on their influencing skills. And maybe you have a specific scenario where you help prepare them for it and they were going to use, you know, influencing approach X, but you helped coach them, you know, do some role plays and they end up using, using Y, like just, you know, sanitize it, but to the extent you can share specifics of how, how have you, would you help someone change their influencing approach? It's a great, uh, great uh, inquiry, Will. I'm just thinking uh, to myself, uh, what, what, which of the recent uh, such situations uh, is best to to uh, to share. Um, maybe I'll share the the, the example that uh, that I was discussing with um, also another McKinsey colleague of ours a uh, long time ago, um, which is that. Um, you know, the, the person uh, is, is trying to do a transformational project like many uh, in, in a company that's well run. And, um, and then she, uh, you know, has mastered all the technical aspects of uh, the project. Um, but uh, there's a problem really with some of the key leaders that uh, are involved in the project. Um, their relationship has actually become a barrier to the, you know, really the, the constructive participation of all these leaders who really need to buy in and fully execute uh, the technical solution that they're developing. So we talked about um, what are her uh, degrees of freedom in influencing this uh, situation. So, you know, I explored several angles with it. Well, number one, how much do you really care about this? Because uh, if you define your role as defining the technical solution, then she's do already doing incredibly well. Uh, but if she really uh, cares about the longer term implementation success and the business impact of this technical solution on the co entire company, then she needs to set uh, more ambitious uh, influence outcomes as it relates to influencing the leaders of, um, of who, the business leaders who are involved uh, in this. And, and then we discuss, okay, then what could she do if she wanted to um, with the, the, the leaders? You know, does she try to persuade them using logic that you know, showing them all the stats of uh, transformational efforts, IT implementations that have gone bad? Or um, you know, she uh, she she persuades them much more um, by pointing out uh, where the lead they each of them need to exert uh, more leadership. Um, and does she do that in one on one or in a small group situation? So um, that uh, is is a life example of um, you know how we help uh, more senior executives um, think about uh, the positive influence. Uh, challenges and opportunities they have. Uh, we also do this with MBAs. Um, so we've been running a course uh, for uh, 250 MBAs uh, in the last uh, 12 years um, out of the National University of Singapore's uh, MBA program, which is a top 25 program in the world, whereby, you know, literally in a boot camp, people will go through uh, 15, 20 um, real life situations that they get to role play through and see how they really show up in the heat uh, in the heat of the moment. And we encourage people to adopt uh, the deliberate conscious influencing process so that um, they can really internalize it for themselves and, and use it uh, in um, every um, situation that, uh, that they face um, both in school, but really far, far beyond. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on influencing approaches to influencing that are maybe underused right that are effective but that people tend not to have as their default approach so like for me and for a lot of people you know who go into management consulting their default approach may be sort of rational explaining right so um yes, yes. making a, a kind of you know appealing to facts and figures and um logical argument 
Whereas uh, that training that I referred to earlier really opened my eyes to expand my toolbox. And um, one of my favorites was appearing, appealing to shared uh, objectives. Um, that was where, and I actually, and then I, would, I remember specifically like learning that and then deploying that intentionally where I was on one project and a client was not wanting to share the data or argue about something. And I just kind of said, well, just let's just pause both of us. Seems like we have some different ideas on how to approach this, but I think we both have the same objective here as we're trying to like, whatever it was, I don't remember, like drive, you know, drive sales or reduce churn or something. And that was so helpful to kind of get on the same side of the table, looking at the problem together. Like, hey, we're both trying to solve the same thing. So that for me, that appealing to shared objectives was valuable. Learning about the consultative approach where you try to ask the other person, well, what do you see as the right path forward rather than telling them, oh, here's the, here's the path you should take. What are some approaches that you see that are highly effective, but um, you know, executives, tend not to be using them as much as they ought to. Thanks for, for that great question, uh, Will. So first of all, I have a tremendous amount of respect for, for example, there's a whole, the, there's a huge amount of uh, great uh, body of work around how to build common grounds in negotiation situations. So finding that the shared objectives, appealing to people's uh, building that connection to shared objectives, uh, common ground is, I think, very, very powerful. Um, I think the consultative approach is very powerful because it really establishes mutuality. It gets the listing going, et cetera. So, um, but I think the limit uh, and really where to go beyond those set is really engaging the person uh, about them uh, and uh, not just how they think about uh, the the particular task uh, that may be uh, at uh, at stake. And why is that important? I think it's important in situations where you know people's level of uh, motivation or gung ho is in doing the difficult work. In um, you know why are they resistant? Uh, if you need people to go up, way above and beyond their normal. Uh, to you know, really face up to disruption and to do the the difficult change work, then um, it won't be enough to just uh, touch on how they feel and think about uh, the approaches to the work. Um, but uh, you need to delve uh, into how they really feel about uh, themselves and their own identity and their own um, you know attitudes and inspiration or or lack thereof. Uh, related to um, their own sort of where they are in, in their work and in, in relation to what the work is asking them uh, to, uh, to do. So I think some uh, of the tactics that can uh, actually uh, help is often I find, we find that consultants tend to relate to their clients as to their clients' roles or their clients' seniority. Um, so we find that the, the under leverage tactic is really how do you build that strong connection to the client, the person inside, because it's the person inside that has all the human emotions versus the persona of the client or the, the, the seniority is, you know, somebody who is composed, somebody who can give you five reasons why they should or shouldn't do this. But, you know, is that really how they think and, and feel, right? So how do you establish um, that? Um, I would say the second uh, underused tactic, um, which uh, is on the opposite end of the spectrum, is, is actually confronting. Oftentimes, if we believe in something so much, uh, rational persuasion uh, is our go-to. But what if somebody's just really resistant, don't believe you, or they have a completely set of different beliefs? And then confronting that, and I don't mean confronting as in like really intense and uh, and uh, you know, conflictual, but confronting just knowledging, hey, you seem to be um, really don't feel the same way about this like many others, or you really don't seem to uh, believe this uh, and you doubt this, tell me more. You know, because uh, unless we um, have a shared belief about this, it's very difficult to move forward. So uh, we, those are examples of um, tactics really that have to do with the relationship between um, 
uh, different people and then how to use that to build a deeper foundation of uh, shared understanding and shared feelings really and shared belief um, uh, on the task uh, to do the more difficult bits. In chapter 13 of the book, uh, you talk about a term that Linhart uh, coined high challenge, how high support. Um, the chapter is how others can help you develop. Talk to me a yes, bit about yes. someone who, you know, who wants to develop their influence skills. Um, how can you get help from other people? And tell us a bit about this high challenge, high support uh, model. My favorite topic, uh, one of my favorite topics. Uh, so I first learned, uh, it got inspired by high challenge, high support in two ways. One is from Sun Yen himself, who definitely high challenge, high support me every day. I really like to have that. But also from um, a book called Teach Like a Champion, where they studied um, uh, what did the most powerful teachers in the most difficult schools, um, inner cities, in the United States, um, uh, how were they able to get the high performance uh, from their students? And we're talking about elementary high school students, you know, this is not college or beyond. And um, I realized that uh, the two really had something uh, in common, which is that high challenge is all about setting high ambitions, but really having people set high ambitions for themselves. Um, this could apply to influence effectiveness, could apply to themselves as leaders or them in sports or really anything as parents, um, of course, in, in business uh, situations. And that often requires um, really instilling a sense of belief and confidence. A lot of times people don't uh, aspire for more, not because uh, they don't theoretically understand that it's possible but they lack that confidence and belief in themselves. And that could come from uh, personality predisposition, it could come from trauma, it could come from, uh, you know, just never had that uh, experience uh, before. Now with high challenge, um, you need high support in order for the person to achieve it. Now put in the influence uh, context, um, high support often needs to come in the form of really quality feedback uh, real time. Uh, because uh, if you don't get that uh, feedback on what's working in your influence and leadership efforts and what's not, um, it's very difficult to improve because uh, our own self-awareness of how we're doing is um, limited, even for the best of us. Um, many of us tend to overestimate our effectiveness. By definition, it's hard to really know what people think of us or feel about us and our influence attempt. Um, just by ourselves. So I think here's where, you know, the best of what we experienced in the firm will, where teams would get together and debrief, hey, how did that go? What went well? What didn't go well? But if you apply that using the deliberate conscious uh, influencing process um, and really zero in on the influence aspect, which we find is uh, really under, uh, uh, under uh, paid attention to, if you will, um, is uh, is really where you can get uh, the high the high support uh, going, and I think for independent professionals, it will take a little bit more conscious effort to to ask yourself, you know, where could my high challenge, high support uh, come from? So it might be another collaborator, or maybe even someone at your client who you build that personal relationship with, and they start to really care about your development, and not just what you do for them. Yeah. What is uh, one thing that you'd like listeners to take away who want to improve their influence skills? Like what's the one or two, one or two or three things that we should keep top of mind uh, that we should remember on Monday morning uh, if we were trying to improve our influence skills? I think it starts with the why. I mean, uh, if I remember my my peers and my my fellow friends uh, from uh, McKinsey days and, and beyond, you know, we're all in some ways um, have high aspirations and idealism, right? But we're also probably 15, 20, 30 years in, into our careers. And and um, so, so I would say, you know, reflect on your why. What is the positive outcome that you really want to have? 
uh, beyond the projects that you're doing, right? What What is the, the ethos of what you're doing and the purpose? Because I think positive outcome, it all depends on how much positive outcome we want to have and, and why, right? So that I think is um, the first uh, part. The second part for consultants, I would say just less time on the PowerPoint and on process, more paying attention to the individuals and really seeing them as individuals and human beings and connect with them at, uh, at that level, um, be it uh, emotions and, and state and, and just really pay attention to that because like that I think will yield a whole new horizons of, uh, of why they, they love what you do or maybe they, they actually have some, some questions about what you do and what you're trying to do for their company. Um, so with that, and, and, you know, find a learning, learning buddy, somebody who can give you that feedback on your influence, what's working, what's not, um, why maybe even kick you under, under the table if they think you need to adjust in, in a meeting, um, because that will make uh, all the difference. So the book is Positive Influence, the first and last mile of leadership, Weijin for listeners who wanted to follow up and learn more about your firm or about the book, where would you point them online? Just go to www.positiveinfluence.life. Um, you'll definitely find more information about the book. Uh, you can do the plus influence assessment where you can do a little uh, fun, but serious, a uh, little quick take uh, on your own influence uh, uh, skills and, and actually get other people's feedback uh, in a very user-friendly fashion and get all the resources on how you can deepen your own uh, influence. Amazing. Weijin, thank you so much for joining today and congratulations on the new book. Thank you so much. We see it as the long haul. We hope to really contribute to uh, this as the next classic and in influence after Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence. So uh, if you like the book, uh, please uh, buy more copies for your friends, family, mentees, clients, um, and leave us a review on Amazon. Thank you. Yeah.